You know, I've uh, been doing this for a few years, um, and I guess, if anything, I've been more surprised than uh, I expected in these last four, five years. It's, uh, you know, I ran the presidency in 08 and in 12, and I always assumed that uh, people were going to stay sound asleep forever, and that my responsibility was to go to Washington and do the best I can, and maybe someday somebody would look at the voting record and say, hey, you know, that's a little bit different. What's the matter with this guy? He keeps voting for the Constitution all this time. <laughs> uh, anyway, something's happened though along these last several years, and I'm delighted with it, because the one thing that I've noticed is a lot of young people are very interested, and they've become very much involved in the freedom movement, and they're very concerned about the country, and they'd like to see some big changes made. And uh, today, you know, uh, I think it's 
sort of turned on, on his head. Um, we, uh, we would like to have our privacy, and the government wants its secrecy. It should be, uh, should, should, and the government wants to invade our privacy. I think the government there should be, be there to protect our privacy, and we should know what the government is doing, and they should be. Because tolerance says so often means that you endorse something. But the, and it really isn't true, but a lot of people think that. Well, if we tolerate any behavior and they do things I don't like and I consider them immoral and, and that it, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's a vice, then I don't want them to do it. But just because we're tolerant of other people and let them have their own religious life, their own philosophic life, their own social life, their own sexual life, doesn't mean you endorse what they do. We tolerate people, they do a lot of weird things in religion, but we tolerate it. Some people don't have a religion, and we should tolerate that too. But that is hard for some people. Some liberals say, well, you can't tolerate, uh, you, you can't allow that because people might spend their money the wrong way and they won't plan for their future, and we have to take care of them. Well, the tolerance is that uh, some people might not do a good job. But the handwriting's on the wall. The government has done a lousy job, and that's why the responsibility has to come back to the people to make up their own decision for their own benefits. <laughs> in, this, in the social, social sense, people have uh, social habits that, uh, you know, uh, I just don't want any part of it. But I also know that I don't have the moral authority or the legal authority in a free society. If they're doing some things that might hurt themselves, but they're not hurting me, I say it's not my business. It'll cause more harm than it's worth for me to start regulating the personal moral habits if they're not hurting people. That sometimes is hard for people uh, to, to accept. But tolerance does not mean endorsement, and that is the big difference. And when you apply this to foreign policy, it's pretty simple for me. You know, uh, mind our own business. Is that complicated? You know, one time in a presidential debate, maybe some of you even watched one of those debates, I suggested, because I was very frustrated and upset with all the wars going on, and I didn't believe we should be there, and we shouldn't be trying to remake Afghanistan, and all the Middle East, and Iraq and all these things, and I thought we were way too aggressive in our right, and um, we were doing this and all these things, I said, I suggested a debate, why don't we accept a foreign policy of the golden rule? Don't do anything to another country that we don't want them to do to us. Not because I am making this up, 
and it's just theoretical. That's the way history has proven. We have had an endorsement of property rights and contract rights and sound money, and we have been and still probably are, you know, the most prosperous country in the world. I'm not sure how long that's going to last, but our middle class is shrinking. But we had the largest middle class ever under those circumstances. And why, if you happen to be a liberal, a, a libertarian, or a conservative, or a free market person, how can we lose the moral high ground? Because if we say, oh yeah, we want free markets, and we want people to work for themselves and take care of themselves, assume responsibility for themselves. Oh, oh, you don't care about people. What you do, you just throw the people in the gutter and never give them, never help them out, and never use government uh, redistribution to, to take care of uh, people like that. And so we lose the moral high ground. And yet, there's no evidence to show that the, that the policy of authoritarianism, of force and use of taxation and regulation, that it works. I think the most vivid, vivid uh, consequence of that policy is out there right now, and it's Detroit, Michigan. If you look at it, you'll see what happens when they'll take care of everybody. It ends up a broke city, and houses breaking down. I mean, just falling apart, and that can happen to an entire country if you pursue it. Unless you say, oh no, we would never do anything like Detroit. We're always going to limit our spending, limit the debt, limit this, and we will be good managers, so we have to have this. I think it's wrong because it doesn't work, and right now we're facing a major crisis because we have drifted a long way from that. For instance, if you take the issue of, uh, of debt, uh, if you want to, I imagine a lot of people in this room would know what our national debt is right now. It's $16.99 trillion. Dollars. And that's a lot of money. It's gone up rapidly in these last couple of years because welfare spending is out of control, military spending, and I don't use the word defense spending, militarism, military spending is out of control, and this debt is just rising. But guess what? which seems to be wonderful with these politicians in Washington, they've made sure that the national debt hasn't risen. In, a, in approximately the last four months, guess what? The national debt hasn't gone up one penny. Four months ago, it was $16.99 trillion. They just ignore it. They just keep borrowing money and spending money and everything's on autopilot. Republican leadership, are they yelling and screaming? Why are you spending all this money? You know, just in, in August, uh, there was a, a deficit of $187 billion. Where did they get the money? It, it's, it's illegal to raise, spend money that, uh, without raising the national debt. They just do it. And uh, this is essentially what happened during the uh, bailouts, uh, during, during the economic crisis a few years ago. Uh, Congress passed $900 billion, it seems like a nice sum of money, and they pass that on to their friends. But the Fed was involved with $12, 15000000000000 trillion, taking care of all their friends and bailing out foreign central banks and foreign governments and corporations. And uh, unfortunately, it's so big and so out of control that uh, all it does is it increases the uh, financial bubble. You thought the financial bubble was big in 08. Uh, where do you see when it becomes apparent or how big this one is? And this is the reason that this so-called humanitarian instinct uh, to take care of people. I, I would assume that, uh, you know, the people in Congress, uh, probably 98% uh, of those who vote for that big spending do it with good intentions. And they really want to help, uh, help people. Now, other individuals who may be behind the scenes and why the money is being spent, who gets bailed out, and how the military industrial complex makes money, and all the con contracts go up, that's different. They know it, exactly what is happening. It's a pretense that they're taking care of the middle class and the poor. But when the bailouts came, and to the tune of these hundreds of billions and trillions of dollars, it helped the people out that, was, that were ripping us off in the meantime. They were the ones that were doing the derivatives that went bankrupt. So where did the bailouts go? To help them out. What happened to the middle class? It shrunk, people lost their jobs, and they lost their houses. So it's, a, it's an all fraud, this whole idea that this system is taking care of the poor people, and this is the way you redistribute wealth. 
Well, they've tried authoritarianism for a long time, throughout the many centuries. Uh, they've tried communism in the last century, and it's proven to be failure. In different forms of socialism, and we've, tra we've tra uh, been working on this uh, welfareism uh, and printing of money and, and endlessly making sure nobody falls through the cracks. Well, guess what? It's failing. It's, it's very apparent and it's not going to work. So the burden now falls on the next generation, those who attend the college like this, and those individuals who are coming of age who will be making decisions for the country. Because this will not continue. It's impossible to continue. The handwriting is on the wall. We see this, the debt is just too big, and you can't solve the problem of debt by spending more money and having more debt. Even though that is literally taught in Keynesian economics that if you have a slump, no matter what, well, you have to spend more money. Now, if you had a personal budget problem and uh, you had too many credit cards out and you were somebody that wanted to work your way out and uh, figured it, what you do, you would have to take another job and cut back spending and work your way out back to the point where you could have economic growth again. Well, the principle isn't any different for a country. You just can't all listen and say, okay, well, it's different for a country because we can, uh, we're a sovereign nation, we can borrow money, we can raise taxes, and we can print money. But think, things are changing, and that is why the challenge is very, very great and why it's so important for this coming generation to know and understand, you know, exactly what is going on. You know, the system in Washington, everybody talks about it, they claim it's broke. And it's, uh, the system is broke because the uh, philosophy is broke, and we see it as a broke political system. And um, they talk about, uh, you know, if we only had bipartisanship, we could just be getting the public and the Democrats to come together and solve the problems together. You sacrifice this, you sacrifice this, and we all come together. Don't, don't be rigid in any of your beliefs. I think that's completely wrong. I don't think you should ever have to sacrifice. They say, <laughs> the comments have been made to get out of this recession that everybody has to sacrifice something. Now, if I come in and tell you that if I had the ability to do it, and I went and I shrunk the size of government, I balanced the budget, we had a sound currency, we had st steady prices because we had a sound currency, we deregulated the economy, we stopped fighting these wars, we protected civil liberties, and we got rid of the Federal Reserve and the income tax, what would you be sacrificing? are the ones who are living off you and living off the government. The people who get the bailouts and they get the contracts and they pump up armaments that we don't need. They're the ones who have a, a setback. You know, uh, but in Washington, um, they, they claim that uh, there's a partisan victory. I don't, I don't really, I mean, on the surface that's true and for the struggle for power that is true. But when it comes to deep philosophy, there, there is no, no contest. They, they come together. That's in the leadership position. Take, for instance, just recently we had a, a, a vote in the Congress that, that was the Justin Amash Amendment, which talked about reigning in NSA. I think that would be a good idea. <laughs> but the establishment, leaders on both sides, they don't want to rein in the NSA. They think it's necessary to keep the tail on what everybody's doing. And besides, you know, that falls into the category of foreign policy and watching for the bad guys and all, all those things. But that amendment failed but only by like a dozen votes, very, very close, because the leadership of the Republicans and the Democrats got together and they support, they, 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 uh, they took away their support. They did not want that amendment to pass. But the people, people like you called the congressman, and the congressman, Republicans and Democrats at the grassroots level, especially the younger members, got together and they responded by, uh, by you know, trying to get that bill passed. And this is, you see the same thing on this war issue. I look at it. Uh, 
John Boehner and Nancy Pelosi are on the stage together where we ought to, we ought to give the president support, send the bomb.